Good morning. This is Daniela Mello. I'm a lecturer for CGS and uh, I'm in the Division of Social Sciences. And this morning I'm taking over the Instagram page to answer some questions that you may have about the election. I'm, I hope I can answer most of those questions or at least give you an informed opinion about what's going on right now. And uh, I see that Chelsea's waving at me. Hi, Chelsea. We have already received some questions, but um, let me tell you perhaps a little bit more about me before I start. I'm a political scientist by training. I focus on um, comparative politics and international relations. I teach classes for the sophomore year. Uh, this year I'm teaching Russia and China, and next semester I'll be teaching U.S. foreign policy. And I'm, I've been a keen observer of the American election, as I'm sure almost all of you and every other citizen in the United States this year. Um, it's, it's been quite an intense week, in fact, quite an intense month. Um, and, and I have spent actually a lot of time thinking about what's going on. And um, uh, one, another thing I can tell you is that I'm Portuguese, like the accent that you're hearing uh, is that I have received over the past few weeks from um, from several of my um, of my contacts in Europe in particular but you know in all parts of the world everyone is actually doing the count with us for the Electoral College and that's really incredible right I mean the world is learning about the Electoral College and um, waking up every morning and seeing how the map has changed just like all of us so I see that I already have a few questions here. I'm going to start with perhaps a broad question and then go to the more specific ones. One of the questions that we got immediately was how is this election different? And I feel that, you know, this, this election is different in many, many, many different ways from previous elections. Um, one of them is this is an election that is happening um, at a very, very highly charged, highly polarized moment in American society. So we have um, levels of polarization that we haven't had for several decades. Uh, I mean, we may even find that we're more polarized now than ever. Um, that polarization has really driven the mobilization of the vote on both sides, which is, I think, the second great story about this particular election is the turnout. I mean, I think that for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking over and over and over again just about how many Americans actually made it to the ballot box. It's incredible, right? So I have been following, for instance, youth turnout. I mean, youth turnout in places like Texas was record breaking. I mean, Texas broke all sorts of records, right? Last I checked, the turnout in Texas was like 109% from what it had been in 2016. Um, and I think that number was before Tuesday, right? before um, people actually went to vote in, play, in, in person. So we, what is very clear is that um, whether against Trump, for Biden, <laughs> or for Trump, uh, every single or, or almost every single registered voter felt compelled to participate, to take a side and to go cast a ballot. So that in itself is, is really extraordinary. Turnout uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to hear a lot about, and we're already hearing a little bit, but the numbers are kind of, we, we don't have exact numbers yet about African American turnout, about the Latino vote or the Hispanic vote. Um, so, I mean, those are things that we'll be looking at for several weeks, but turnout as it is already is a huge story. You know, another thing that makes this election incredibly different is President Trump himself, of course, right? We have been talking, I mean, we all know that the president has been 
casting doubts and casting aspersions about um, the vote even before the vote started, right? So, and we also know that the president has said multiple times that um, he might not accept the count. And in fact, last night, it's most of us probably heard, if you didn't hear, Last night, the president um, went live, you know, arguing that there was electoral fraud, that um, um, that some of the vote counts should stop, that they should continue in other places. I mean, and it was a, a mishmash of allegations for which the president has not yet um, delivered hardcore evidence. And in fact, we know that because this has been brought to a few courts already and the courts have rejected taking the issue on the basis of the lack of evidence. So it is incredible. Um, and and it, it does make this election really distinct from previous elections. It breaks all the norms of, US, of modern US presidencies that we have a president that is not willing to um, believe the vote count to to come in the middle of the vote count and 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 allege that um, that there's fraud without providing any evidence and who throughout the entire campaign has either refu has refused over and over and over again to to state that he would accept the results of the election. So it's um, that in, it, in and of itself, right, makes this very, very unusual. The other thing that makes this election very unusual, as you can see, like my, my brain's going through a list of topics about what makes this, this election so different and so many things, right? That this election is happening in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic. And that global pandemic um, has further complicated what is already a complicated electoral system in the United States. Like I grew up in Europe and I can assure you that most Europeans look at our system and say, how is this possible? How is it possible that there is not a standardized way of counting ballots, right? For all of the states in the United States. I mean, how how is it possible that every state gets to make its own rules about when ballots get to be accepted or don't get to be accepted? This is highly unusual, right? Most modern advanced democracies don't have a system like this. You know, most modern democracies have a system in which um, you actually do have a uniform way of counting ballots, a uniform way of being a registered voter, a uniform way of participating in the process from beginning to end, right? So all the ballots are accepted up to a certain point everywhere. Um, everyone has the same, or, or the rules about the election apply to everyone. Every, I mean, even other federal states operate more or less like this. So the United States is highly unusual already. Um, and it's, it's the way that, um, state by state electoral laws have evolved over the years. Again, highly unusual in the, um, in the democratic world, but this year because of COVID, we had a lot of last minute changes. And when we combine the last minute changes to try to allow you know voters to have access to the ballot box without having to go in person, right? I'm talking about things like uh, mailing votes, early in-person voting, right? Being able to drop your ballot in a, in a drop box at specific locations. A lot of states either created new rules or expanded the rules that they already had in place in order to make it easier for people to vote. When you put that together with President Trump casting his versions on um, the mailing vote, um, changing um, the person who's in charge of the post office, to, um, you know, and, and actually really raising all sorts of doubts about the post office and, and postal workers themselves and the role that they would play in the election. You bring all of this together and you have sort of a perfect storm for a lot of confusion <laughs> during this week and for 
competing narratives about what's happening and um, and what um, you know how we should be reading the outcome and whether you will see yourself as a Trump supporter or as a Biden supporter, if you start going into social media and really looking at the conversations from Trump supporters or from Biden supporters, you can really see that they are completely worlds apart in the types of things that they're discussing. Um, and that's a bit concerning to me, but maybe we'll come to that with a different question. So I spent a bit of time on that one, but that was a huge question. And I think perhaps a, a good way for us to start thinking about this particular cycle. I, I suspect, I've been telling this to my students, I suspect that this is an election that will be telling our children, great ch uh, grandchildren, and maybe even great grandchildren about, um, because it is such an unusual, it's such an unusual year, right? Such an unusual election and moment in American politics. Okay, so let's Try a second question, perhaps. Uh, what happens if Trump refuses to concede, um, even if the electoral vote? Am I getting this question right? I think I am. What happens if Trump hap you know, if Trump loses the electoral college, but he still refuses to concede? Uh, I, you know, my sense from watching President Trump and listening to him over the past few months is that we may have or we may be looking at the first time, at least in my lifetime, you know, someone correct me if they're a historian of the US and this has happened before, but I don't think it has, that um, this may be the first time that we have a president that does not give a concession speech, <laughs> right? And you may think, okay, who cares about the concession speech, but one presidency to the other, the peaceful handling of power, right? And I would say that it's a really important moment um, or an important, an important aspect of ensuring that the losing side begins to come to grips with the new reality, right? The new presidency and, and, and comes to accept, right? That the power has been handed over. I I hope I'm wrong, but I think that President Trump has given us every indication that he will not ever utter the words, I lost this election, right? Um, I mean, not exactly those words, but I, I, I just don't think that the president um, has it in him to come to that. So what happens if he doesn't? My first instinct is to say that a lot of this will hinge on how the Republican Party behaves in the next few days and in the next few weeks. Because, you know, if we have a president that does not accept the outcome of the result, we know because the president has been telling us that, that there will be a number of um, lawsuits. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure because so many of these counts are so close that we're going to see several, several, several recounts uh, or attempts at recounts in, in many of these states. I'm not particularly concerned about recounts. I mean, in some states, they might even be triggered automatically if the vote count is, you know, only 1% or under 1%. Or the difference in the, the vote is under 1% for both sides. But, um, you know, the president clearly wants to follow litigation and, and has claimed that he wants to take this to, to the Supreme Court. I mean, thus far, the lawsuits that I have read about don't seem to truly have legs to go that far. So what, what I do think is most likely here is we are likely to have a president during this interregnum, right, this period between now and December 14th, I believe that's the date, um, when the Electoral College will meet to cast their votes. And between then and January, 
in which you know the institutions may continue to work the same way and go through the motions but the president might continue to rally his supporters to protest to go to the streets to come in defense of what he's claiming is a stolen election that's 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 a scary prospect and that's why i think that the positioning of the Republican Party in particular is going to be really, really, really important here because the Republican Party is going to have to make a choice, right? Do they align themselves with the rhetoric of the president or do they distance themselves and try to defuse it and calm down the nation, right, and, and, and their supporters? And in the worst case scenario, you know, I'm sure that all of you have heard about what the military might do I mean, we've heard, I think, calmly and sort of quietly, but very clearly from military leaders that they don't want to be involved in this if they don't absolutely have to. Um, but we have what we have also heard very clearly is that, you know, they will follow um, the rules of the electoral game, right? So there's been some pretty strong signals from, you know, institutional stakeholders that, um, they, they will follow the count, they will follow the vote count. But um, the real fear for the United States, of course, with a president that um, would refuse to concede or you know, that would continue to fan the flames of, um, and, and perhaps radicalize um, some of his voters, um, is that you know, we might see a period of instability. But not that let's, let's hope not. Um, let me see, another question. What else do I have here? Um, what can I say about the African American and, and Latin American uh, and, and turnout? And uh, I, I don't know that I have too much information about African Americans and, and you know the Hispanic voting bloc just yet. Um, what we know, Right, is that polling seem to have been really, really off in some states. In other states, you know, everything is within the margin of error now, and as and the vote is still coming in, so it's really very, very early to do a post mortem on polling. But what seems clear is that African Americans overwhelmingly came out in support for Biden in different parts of the state. I mean, I know that a lot has been yesterday in the news. I heard a lot about. Um, the 10% of African Americans that, um, or that apparently voted for Trump, and um, I, I, you know, I, I think the big story is that 90% of African Americans came out for um, for, for President Biden, and um, I, I do think that more than ever, this has always been a discussion, but this this election I think highlighted the diversity of the his. Hispanic voting bloc because what we call Hispan the Hispanic world in the United States is a very, very, very diverse group of people, both ethnically, um, even linguistically, racially, um, and in terms of their political history and, and what they've been exposed to, um, you know, before they moved to the United States or if they're second and third and fourth generation, um, you know, what their family history has been and where they live. So all of these things, what, what we are learning quite cl clearly is that the, the Hispanic vote is, uh, is hardly really a block. <laughs> Maybe in some states, but in others, it's actually quite diverse. So it seems very clear, for instance, that uh, in Southern Florida, right, the, 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 the Latino vote was very divided. Um, and some segments of the Latino vote, they were divided by region of origin in Latin America, right? So if you were of Central American origin, you were far more likely to have voted for Biden. But if you were a Cuban American, you actually slightly, like Cuban Americans favored Trump over, um, over Biden. So I guess my story here, or my point here with this question is that it's a great question. I don't know that I have enough information to talk more than what I just said about it, but I do think that that's going to continue to be a really big story about this election as well, right? What happened with Latino vote and whether we should really be so, um, I mean, should we even for simplicity sake in terms of 
talking about the elections, but should we really be talking about the Latino vote block or, or Hispanic vote block? And I, I suspect that the answer is no. I see a question um, coming here that is a question that somebody else had actually asked. What can Biden do to unite the country? And uh, I think Steph uh, says, if Trump continues to rally his supporters, how will the Democrats unify the country? Uh, that's, um, that's an excellent question. I, um, I'm a little concerned as a citizen that I haven't heard you know, more from the Biden campaign about how exactly they intend to go about unifying the country. It will, um, it will be very difficult if the president continues down this path and if he finds supporters, um, if, he find, if the president ends up finding supporters within the Republican Party, right, for the types of arguments that he's been making, um, you know, we're not talking about a mo we're basically, we may be looking at two or three months in which polarization is only going to increase and in which we really have a radicalization, not just uh, rhetorically, right? Not just um, in, t in terms of discourse, but in the streets, right? So we are looking uh, very clearly at the possibility of some violence, of protests, counter protests, of, you know, protesters being met with, you know, armed militias, all of the concerns that, you know, have been raised over the past few months and that we saw play out during the summer and here and there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of Kenosha, for instance, I'm thinking of the attempted uh, or the plans to kidnap the, the the Michigan governor, right? All of these are signals that, you know, there are groups out there who are really willing to come to the streets and, and, and take matters into their own hands. Um, so all of these are very deeply concerning. And if we think about how Biden can approach this, if, you know, if, if we have a worst case scenario over the past, over the next few weeks and, um, and there's a lot of mobilization on the streets and, and, and some confrontations, particularly in urban areas. Biden, you know, Biden's first task is going to be to not just try to pacify the streets, but try to reach the audience that is currently completely closed off to him. And Again, to come back to my earlier point, I haven't yet heard how exactly he intends to do it, um, or even of very specific strategies for how they would do it. But there are so many variables, um, and things can, you know, things can be a lot more peaceful. Um, I think that if Mitch McConnell comes out, you know, Mitch McConnell yesterday refused to make a statement about what the president was saying. Um, I think it is very important that someone like Mitch McConnell comes out and refutes um, these allegations of fraud uh, unless there is real evidence of, of any fraud being committed. So I guess my answer here is <laughs> perhaps I'm not helping the people who ask. I think that Biden, you know, is going to have a huge task on his hands. I don't think that this will happen immediately. Um, People are not, people who truly believe President Trump and who truly believe that the elections being stolen by President Trump aren't simply going to change their frame of mind overnight once, you know, President Biden comes in and does a speech or two. So they will have, it will be a long process of regaining the trust of the electorate. And one thing that I'll say as a political scientist is that any student of democracy and of democratic processes will tell you is that democracy is far more than just institutions. For a democracy to really work, you need to have the trust of the electorate in the process, right? The trust of the electorate that their vote matters. Um, people truly need to believe that the process is fair, that the process is transparent, and that their vote matters. And all of these things have come under attack in this election. And um, so it is a, an incredibly vulnerable moment for American democracy. I, I'm not the only person saying that, but if you truly think about 
how fragile um, a democracy can be, we're there, right? This is, this is arguably the most vulnerable moment in American democracy because we not only have a president that have attacked some of the central pillars of what you know holds uh, the institution of democracy, um, but but we have a hi sorry a call came in and in interrupted my live feed. Um, where was I? So we not only have a president that has attacked the central pillars of what makes a democracy a democracy, right? But we. We have huge portion of the population that um, seems to have lost trust in those processes. And uh, again, I think one of the main tasks that Biden will have is to rebuild that trust. So I don't know what the answer will be. Perhaps some massive campaigns of, you know, civic education about the um, about how. The vote works more transparency though i mean the vote counting has been fairly transparent you know and and recorded and and you know but um but that's not the narrative so there's a lot of work to do in terms of of convincing voters again that this is a system worth saving okay so i see let me see if there's a new question here Ah, so Chelsea asks, what do you think the chances of a Senate flip are with the runoffs in Georgia? I think that if we have two runoffs in Georgia, Georgia is going to feel pressure, not just from the United States, but from the whole world. I mean, can you imagine if the balance of the Senate for the next couple of months really hangs on Georgia? I mean, it, it's it's going to be intense. Um, I, I I don't know how to predict that. It's um, it, the Democrats are hopeful that there's um, that Alaska might still be in play for the Senate, and that these two seats in Georgia might still be in play um, with the runoffs. So, you know, it's possible. I don't have any sort of secret information about what might happen afterwards. It's possible. Right. But what we will see, particularly in Georgia, is, you know, both parties are going to pour so many resources. Oh, to be a Georgian, <laughs> to be a Georgian this week and to be a Georgian over the next few months. Right. They're really going to feel watched. <laughs> they're going to feel, you know, they're going to be um, like the Iowa of the, am I remembering that correctly? Like they're going to be like the first state. Um, or going to feel like the most important state in uh, in this election. Uh, I suspect it might already be feeling like that. It's incredible that Georgia is in play and that Biden is actually leading in Georgia right now. That's that's very telling about this election as well. And it's, it's another incredible thing because Georgia has not been has not gone blue since it went blue for Clinton in his first election. So yeah, all eyes will be on Georgia. It is within the realm of possibility, but we'll have to wait and see. So another question here, what do you think are the key takeaways for Democrats for future elections? Whew. Um, key takeaways from this election. Do not take uh, the Hispanic vote for granted. <laughs> I, 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 that, that's a huge takeaway from Florida in particular. While the, the Miami-Dade County uh, is, is really the big story in, um, in the Florida election and why Trump won Florida. Um, Miami-Dade went blue, right? But it didn't go blue by the margins that it could have gone, right? And so you know, the mobilization of the vote was not as strong as Biden needed it to be. The, the, you know, the people showing up to vote, that's what I mean. So not as many people, many people showed up to vote in Miami-Dade and they gave Miami-Dade County to the Biden, um, to the Biden camp, but they needed the numbers to be a lot higher in order to actually balance some of their losses in other counties, right? So 
what, what we saw in Miami Dade was that the Trump campaign spent a lot of money, a lot of money um, running ads uh, to try to influence um, the vote and ads that, um, you know, depicted Biden as a socialist, right, as a communist, as someone who wanted to turn the United States into a Venezuela. And what's incredible is how much that actually sticks, right, with um, with a certain type of voter, even Russian voters, right, in that um, in that part of Florida that also went overwhelmingly for. I believe I saw this correctly, but I, I actually do need to double check that statement. I think they went overwhelmingly for Trump as well. Um, it's been. I feel like this is the perhaps the last election. This election is like the last hurrah of. Uh, Communism versus capitalism <laughs> in, uh, in um, from from Cold War rhetoric. You know, we're seeing soon enough um, many or you know within the coming years and coming elections, a lot of the um, a lot of the people that will be running for president will be post Cold War children, right? People that no longer talk about communism and socialism. Um, and painted with, you know, this really broad brush. But it seems to have worked with some parts of the electorate. And um, it certainly works with older voters and it's resonant with older voters that, um, you know, grew up thinking about that sort of framework. And, you know, it's a simple attack, but an effective one. So I think Democrats need to, to, to look at why that worked and where it worked. Um, other takeaways for Democrats, um, I think a really important takeaway for this election is that we all understand that the coalition for Biden is an uneasy one, that the enthusiasm for the Biden ticket wasn't truly there for the vast majority of people that actually voted for Biden. And if we don't want um, a complete fall apart of uh, this ticket in four years, Biden's going to have to be really responsive to progressives and to the demands of progressives that, you know, really came out very heavily um, in support of Biden, right? But not necessarily in support of you know, um, his, his um, positions on some, some, some issues. There's obviously, a, I'm not saying that they're in two different planets, you know, there's, they're not. Um, but it is very clear that progressives came out to vote, that the youth came out to vote, that uh, progressive issues are going to be on the table. And if the Democratic Party wants to keep progressives on their side four years from now, right, when, when they're up for re-election, they're going to have to really concede more than they have thus far, right? Or at least work together more and have less of a, um, less of a combative, let's say, uh, attitude towards the younger progressive wing of the party. Uh, and I mean that by voters. I don't actually even mean, you know, the AOC squad and, and anything like that. I mean, I, I actually mean voters. Uh, they will need to see some level of responsiveness. Uh, what the DNC might also want to look at is whether or not they can keep some of the moderate Republican vote that uh, they've garnered right for for this election and i'm actually very curious to see you know whether we get some 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 serious numbers on how many centrist conservatives um ended up voting for biden but might have been just enough in some of the states that we're still looking at to have made a difference so i would say right now those those are some of the the main things in my mind and i think that biden has a really arduous task in his hands, right? Because on one hand, he is now going to be given the task to unify the country um, in its most polarizing moment, but he also needs to unify the left, um, which was unified in this sort of negative coalition against Trump, but he needs to make this a coalition pro-Biden, <laughs> right? So I, I need to see that transition happening and um, I haven't seen that yet. But again, it's Sue. I'm not certainly not putting it on the Biden campaign to um, 
to do all of these things overnight and that even now right there's there's very important things at hand that that need to happen um before you know we get to inauguration and um and the new president as it's looking right now it it seems um fairly i mean i'm actually right behind my phone here i have the map um open in front of me and um I mean, the likelihood of a Biden presidency is is very, very high. I, that's that's what we're looking at in the map right now. Do we have any other questions? Let me see. Do we see any new questions here? Um, if you're just coming in, hi, <laughs> Professor Mello. Um, I'm a lecturer in social sciences at CGS. And we're talking about some of the scenarios and some of the difficulties of the current moment. If you have questions, please post them. So some of the things, well, you know, I'm a teacher, so I can keep talking <laughs> during our, our time. Some, let me tell you actually uh, perhaps a little bit about uh, you know how the world is looking at the United States right now. Uh, I'll speak perhaps more about how Europe is looking at the United States because I've been seeing it firsthand through my friends and my networks and whatnot. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a major poll um, that is held about every four years in in the European Union and every you know they do this major poll on who would you vote for if you voted for if you had a vote in the American election and surprise surprise the overwhelming amount the overwhelming um European voter uh sorry European voter overwhelmingly uh would cast a vote for Biden and I mean overwhelmingly and what I found really interesting was that this was also true state by state Right. So whether you ask state by state within the European Union, you ask the French, you ask the Italians, you ask the Polish, the Porsche, the Spaniards, right? Everyone selected Biden over Trump. And um, the Europeans are also going through, you know, their populist moment. And it one of I mean, there are many, many reasons why they really would like to see a change in leadership in the United States. There's been a fracturing of the relationship between the transatlantic alliance over um, this administration. And uh, there's been a or there's a great desire for a normalization of re relations between the Europeans and the Americans again. But, you know, I think at a deeper level, um, a lot of you, like Europe has also been dealing with a very strong wave of right wing populism, right, in which I would also insert President Trump as, as a right wing populist. Um, so France, for instance, in their last election, the runoff was between Marine Le Pen and Macron, right, and Marine Le Pen is, is a nationalist, um, very xenophobic politician, um, very far right. And I mean, she made it to the runoff in the presidential election in France. We've also heard about how Germany has had the rise of uh, the Alter Alternative für Deutschland, right? The AFD. Um, so we have this a far right party that gained really a, a very large, um, a very good representation right within um within within germany and that is very concerning and we've had the likes of Viktor orban in hungary that has gone much farther uh he's has even changed the constitutional rules in order to make it harder for the opposition to um to gain elections against his party so europe too is going through sort of an earthquake of <laughs> a populist wave. And a lot of these populist leaders, whether in Poland, uh, in the UK, or in the, um, or in Hungary, or even Martin Le Pen, have kept, um, or have, have kept proximate relations with uh, 
uh, approximate relationship with President Trump. So there's really a feeling that where America goes, populism might go. So once America, you know, it, it, it's a very big symbol and, and a, a very big push for populism in the world. And, and the hope from a lot of Europeans is that um, with the end of populist rhetoric coming out of, at the international level, coming out of the White House, that um, the hopes of their own populace might also uh, be cut short. So I saw that another question came in, so I'm going to stop this line of thinking to go and look at the question. Um, why do you think Democrats struggle down ballot, particularly with House races? It's another great question, and again, this is kind of speculative because I think we're going to be pouring over these numbers um, for the next few weeks and try to understand what happened. So I think that the, a part of the answer is probably going to be that mo while there was a lot of talk about the mobilization of the left and how this was going to be the greatest turnout of the left for Biden and there was going to be a blue wave, um, there was less talk. <laughs> Right, and less expectations about the red wave and the red mobilization. And this takes me back to sort of my opening statement about what makes this election um, so extraordinary, right? Um, beyond the ordinary, is that we have massive mobilization on both sides. And in places, so what I suspect, and this is completely speculative, so take it as that, please. Right, but what I suspect we'll find out is that um, in places like Texas, even in places like Florida, there was an undercounting of um, or an underpolling of Trump supporters. Right, but because this was such a such a polarized moment in which people were so mobilized to take a side and cast a ballot. I bet that what we are going to find out was that Trump was actually able to activate a lot of not likely voters, right? So when polls look at, uh, when polls are trying to project uh, who's going to win what, they really, really weigh very heavily likely voters, right? People that have voted before, for instance. I bet, again, speculative, but I bet that what we're going to find out is that Trump was also able to activate a lot of people that maybe would have voted for him four years ago, but stayed home, but did not stay home this time, right? That they showed up to the polls and, and they made sure that they cast a ballot for the president this time around. So I bet that that happened. When another possible explanation and a very likely one, and all of this, I mean, this goes back to the question of you know, why Democrats didn't do as well as they did, right? Part of it is that because more Republicans came out to vote than they kind of expected them to. Um, so another possible explanation or likely explanation that I think we're, we're going to see discussed over the next few weeks is that um, maybe the polling error in places like Texas has actually to do with Trump's, you know, the president has been attacking the polls uh, for the last year, right? Throughout his entire campaign, um, he has attacked the poll numbers and he has accused pollsters of being part of some leftist conspiracy to get him out of, um, to get him out of office. So that has really led to, I mean, he has basically delegitimized um, the polling aspect, right? The, the polling system, the poll pollsters altogether for his voters. Um, what that means in practice is that if you are a Trump supporter, if you're a Trump voter, um, you might be less inclined, right, to actually, once the phone rings and you realize it's the pollster, right, you're probably, like, you might be less inclined to actually participate in the poll. And that leads to under-representation of your views, right? So again, this is all speculative right now, but I think the short answer is, you know, down ballot kind of followed, uh, followed um, what, what happened elsewhere within those states, right? And what happened elsewhere within those states is that, yes, we did have a blue wave, but we also had a red wave to match it. So understanding why, um, 
why that wasn't captured in the polling early on is going to be one of the big stories that you will see. I assure you, the polling world is going to be sort of teas you know, looking at these numbers and, and, and why there was such a wide gap in a place like Texas for the next two months. I mean, this, this is going to occupy their lives, I'm sure. It's a great question. Um, do we have any other questions? I see a lot of waves. Thank you very much. I'm really glad that some of you have been able to join us this morning. I still have about 15 minutes. So if you have a question right now, or if you're looking at returns as they're coming in, um, let us know. What are some of your concerns, right? What um, What's the question that is most pressing in your mind right now? Um, what are you seeing, right, where you are? So I'm not seeing any new questions come in. Um, let me look at the numbers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm refreshing every few minutes like everybody else. My students were telling me in class yesterday that, you know, they've never refreshed their, refreshed their browsers for so many days in a row at, uh, as they've been doing. And I, I think that's true for all of us, right? So I can see that while we were here, right? Um, no new states have been called, but as you probably all know, about an hour ago when we got started, it was announced that um, Joe Biden was now leaving in Pennsylvania. And uh, given, given the number of votes that are still to be tallied and, um, and where they're from in Pennsylvania, it is very, very likely that Joe Biden We'll get to the end of this count and Joe Biden will have taken Pennsylvania as well. Um, same in Georgia, right? So Georgia is probably the state we're going to hear from first of the states that are still outstanding. And um, it, is, it is truly looking like Georgia is going to flip blue. Let's see. What's been really fascinating is to see the story that is happening around Arizona, as I'm sure you've all seen, because it's, again, another story for this election and the difference that it can make to have so much of the vote arrive through mail-in ballot uh, versus the vote that, um, that, that is cast in person on election day. So this is given, this is giving um, a lot of room for President Trump to, um, you know, to argue that there was a red wave and that maybe all of this, the issues that he predicted would happen with mailing votes are actually issues of fraud and not just issues of, you know, the time it takes to count the vote. So I, I do predict that um, this particular weekend, uh, if one of the states gets called today, like if Georgia gets called, it will be a tie, right? We, well, not a tie, but um, Joe Biden will get 269 electoral votes if he gets Georgia today. He needs at least one more to break that tie, one more state, that is. And um, right now, Joe Biden has multiple, multiple paths to victory. The president needs basically all of the states in order to um, to get to victory. So it's um, it's, in the world of probability, it is highly, highly unlikely that um, that President, President Trump will secure a second term. And uh, in, it is, in fact, quite likely that by the end of today, we might have the announcement of, um, you know, a Biden win. OK, we're in the last few minutes of our hour together. Do you have any questions um, or is there any topic that you'd like me to perhaps comment about?
I'm looking at all the people that have joined us today. It's it's really it's really fantastic to see so many people stop by. Um, I know that you stop by and you can't stay for the whole time, and that's perfectly fine and understandable. Um, but I'm happy that you were able to join us today. Um, trying to wave back to some of you as we do this. Um, do you have any other questions? Well, if you don't have any other questions, this might be a good time for me to, uh, oh, I just saw something else come in. Hold on. I was... Ah, another interesting question. Do you think we will continue to see a trend toward mail-in ballot in future elections? I wonder, you know, um, mailing, I mean, mailing ballots, um, it's something that, believe it or not, Republicans were very, very fond of because it tended and, and very proactive at um, getting in the rules of, uh, in the electoral rules because mail-in ballots really help raise the older vote, right? The 65 plus vote. So in a lot of states where Republicans truly depend on older voters coming out and casting a ballot in their favor, we have seen over the years a big push by the Republican Party to institute and, and to make it easier, right, to vote by mail. So that makes it even more extraordinary that in this election, you know, the Republican candidates came out against it, right? And that end up may end up actually being another story of this election, whether or not um, President Trump might have got and some more people to vote for him, right? If he um, if he had supported mailing balloting more, I suspect that in many states it may have come to stay. I mean, especially in blue states, right? Um, same thing with you know expansion of early voting. It seemed to work so well because it gave people multiple opportunities to be able to go and not have to wait for several hours in order to cast their ballots. But if this remains a contentious issue for a long time, we might see again another divide between red states and blue states about the rules that they have about mailing balloting. So I guess that's my best prediction at the moment, that that too might become um, polarized. And I just see another question coming here. So question in the comments about how Georgia lawsuits may affect the race. Um, I personally have not looked in depth into the arguments that are being made in the lawsuits brought about in Georgia. So this, this will be a somewhat superficial answer. They might. Right. I mean, the lawsuit has might have a especially if the lawsuit is bringing into question um, counting of ballots um, or, you know, the accepting or throwing out of ballots in the runoff that that might play um, that might play a really big role in a state like Georgia, where things are really neck and neck. I mean, it's very, very clear uh, that Georgia is now a purple state. Right. That that, you know, the next election um, is going to, the runoffs are going to be, again, highly contentious. I think both parties are going to spend millions, millions, millions of dollars um, into trying to get there, because this is really important, you know, getting control of the Senate is really important for both um, for both parties, but for the Republican Party is absolutely essential because if they lose control of the Senate and Biden wins the presidency, you know, they, they won't have another chance for another two years to try to, to regain control uh, in either the House or, or the Senate to regain control in, in, in Congress. So, um, you know, their only chance to put a stop or to put a break into, you know, a President Biden's policy uh, or set of policies and changes and, and legislation for, for the country is to, you know, maintain control of the Senate. Otherwise, you know, we might actually see, 
you know, rep if Democrats win, they would be able to, if the Democrats actually win control of the, of the Senate, they'd be able to pass a lot of things without ever consulting um, the Republicans. Either way, I don't think that would be a good precedent. <laughs> um, it's not, you know, what, what the Republicans did um, this year was also unprecedented. It's the first time in our history that we have um, a nominee to the Supreme Court, an appointment to the Supreme Court without one single vote from the other side from across the aisle. So, you know, I, I don't even know what to wish for here <laughs> other than um, there's a lot of work to be done to make things bipartisan again or, or to find common ground again within Congress because everyone is so polarized. But again, coming back to the question about Georgia, to be seen, to be seen. I haven't looked at the specific nature of those lawsuits, but it is likely to be highly contentious and it is likely to be very close. So some of those lawsuits might actually have an effect on who gets what seat right in the runoffs. So that's, that's my best answer right now with the information that I have at hand. Do we have any other questions? Let me see if I'm missing something here in the comments. Let's see, I'm just looking at comments here for other potential questions. Oh, Marina asks, are you disappointed in the polls? Or are you confident in the outcomes overall? Uh, specifically in Pennsylvania and in Michigan. Um, I'm not disappointed in the polls. I mean, polls are what they are. They're probabilities, right? And and they're heavily dependent, not just on, you know, the, the um, of course, they're dependent on how different parts of the electorate um, decide to, to respond to them, right? And they're dependent on the formulas and the weighing, right, of, uh, of different factors in those formulas. But we know that like serious pollsters have really worked very, very hard to not make the same mistakes. For instance, overestimating the vote of white college educated voters, right, and underestimating um, blue collar voters. Um, this, this was one of the issues in some of the closed races in 2016 and some of the things that they haven't captured. So, you know, there will be a reckoning within the, the polling world to try to understand, again, what, what happened in places like, you know, what happened in places like Texas, right? What ha we know a bit about what happened in places like Florida. But it is definitely a concern, but I'm not deeply disappointed in polling yet, if that makes sense. Uh, in terms of the confidence in the outcomes overall, um, I am, I'm fairly confident in the outcome because I was very pleased to see that election day went in the country without any sort of major, major issues. And the counting is happening exactly as one expected, you know, from state to state, depending on the rules. And one of the things that, um, we know from previous recounts, even when there are automatic recounts, not necessarily, you know, litigious ones, is that every time a recount happens, nothing changes, right? Normally recounts swing by a few hundred votes, you know, uh, a couple hundred, right? Really not even in the, thou like in the upper hundreds. So in this cases, the, in any of these cases in Wisconsin, certainly, and in Michigan, I, I don't think, History at least tells us that, that I think I stopped streaming for a second, but my last sentence was that history tells us that uh, recounts tend not to really change the outcome altogether. So in that sense, yes, I feel fairly confident uh, in the states that have already been called in. Let me see if I missed any question here. I think, I think I got all the questions. Um, thank you, thank you so much for joining me during this hour. These were excellent questions. Um, well, you're welcome, Marina, I, I see your comments. Um, let's see, let's see what, um, what the map looks like in a few hours, but, um, 
but I think we, I mean, my, my prediction and, and my reading of what's happening is we are looking at um, President Biden coming up. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for staying with me and sending questions. And I hope that this was helpful and um, I'll see you at CGS. Have a good one.